Welcome back to Battery Man. I'm Andrew, and this week I've been asking myself the question, what have I got myself in for? With my first book in hand and access to the training provider's online system, and more than just a little enthusiasm, I'm actually a few weeks ahead. I've dived headfirst into the world of electricity. Let's explore what I've discovered in week one. I started off with some basic units. We have potential difference or voltage, current or ampere, resistance or ohms, and finally power, which can be measured in watts. It's interesting that you can times current and voltage together to get power. Or you can work out, say, the current by dividing the voltage by the resistance. There's a handy triangle that helps us to see their relationship. If we were to imagine a dam with a source of water behind it, the height of the water from the bottom is the potential difference, the pipe is the current, a tap restricting the flow of the water would be the resistance, and the total amount of water that we got out of the dam at the bottom would be the power. Not too difficult, hey? But I mean, this is the first page. If we times the kilowatts by time, so timesing the power by time, then we'll get the energy, which can be measured as kilowatt hours. This is what you'd expect to find on an energy bill. As we're charging kilowatt hours, we can times the kilowatt hours by the price, and we get the total amount billed. Now we know it, it brings me on to the subject that's always intrigued me, power loss and overheating. I remember the relationship between resistance and temperature in wires back from a school project one or two years back. Or a few. Picture this, the current flows through the wire and the wire heats up due to its resistance. This is why electrical extension reels are often recommended to be unspooled. It helps dissipate the generated heat, preventing voltage drop and power loss. Here's something that I haven't thought of before. It's interesting to note that copper isn't the lowest electrical resistance. Despite us finding it in nearly every electrical device that we might use, I've always thought that gold has a lower electrical resistance because it's used on practically everything, like computer circuit boards, and particularly their pins. However, gold is used because it doesn't react or oxidise like copper does. There's me thinking that the gold standard was for its low electrical resistance. As we delve further into the world of electricity, we quickly realise the significance of properly sized cables and ensuring secure connections. Getting this right is crucial to preventing fires and ensuring safe and efficient power transmission through electrical systems. To do this, we need to adhere closely to the wiring regulations BS76 7-1, a set of guidelines that form the backbone of electrical installations. This will come up quite a lot through the studies, I'm sure. Imagine a scenario where the cable is inadequately sized for the load it's carrying. This excessive current passes through the undersized cable and generates heat, just as we discussed earlier with the power loss. As the cable heats up, the risk of overheating and causing a fire becomes very real. On the other hand, using an oversized cable can lead to inefficiencies and unnecessary costs. So how do we determine the correct size cable for a given application? This involves taking into account various factors such as the current rating of the circuit, the type of load being supplied, the cable's installation method and the ambient temperature. By carefully considering these factors and referring to the wiring regulations we discussed before, we can select the appropriate cable size to ensure safe and efficient electrical distribution. Equally vital are secure connections between conductors, switches and other electrical components. 
A loose connector can result in high resistance and heat buildup at the point of contact. Over time, this can lead to sparks, melting, and ultimately a fire hazard. Ensuring tight, reliable connections reduces the risk of heat related issues and keeps electricity flowing smoothly. Now let's talk about circuit protection. How can we safeguard electrical systems from potential hazards such as overcurrent situations? Well, fuses and circuit breakers play a crucial role in protecting the wiring from damage and preventing dangerous scenarios. Picture this, you have a 32 amp circuit and you're running a kettle that draws say 3000 watts. By dividing 3000 watts by 230 volts we find that the kettle pulls around 13 amps. Now if there's no fuse or circuit protection and somehow the kettle starts pulling more power it could potentially lead to a fire in the wiring. However we use a 13 amp fuse to protect the circuit so if the current exceeds the limit the fuse would blow interrupting the circuit and preventing any further damage. For larger systems like ring mains, loops of wire that supply power to multiple devices like kettles, dishwashers and washing machines, there's usually a 32 amp circuit breaker. In normal operation, it won't cause any issues, but if there's ex an excessive current situation, the circuit breaker will trip, protecting the wiring from damage. The advantage of circuit breakers over fuses is that they're resettable while fuses need to be replaced after they blow. We hope this doesn't happen too often, hey? This makes circuit breakers more convenient for everyday use. Let's dive into the concepts of series and parallel circuits, as well as the difference between alternating current, AC, and direct current, DC. These foundational concepts help us understand how electricity flows through different types of electrical circuits. In a series circuit, each load is connected one after the other, forming a single path for current flow. If one component fails or is disconnected, the entire circuit is broken and no current can flow. On the other hand, a parallel circuit, each component has its own path for current flow, creating multiple branches. If one component fails, the others will continue to function independently. As for the difference between AC and DC, AC is the type of current used in our grids. The direction of the flow of electrons changes rapidly, alternating back and forth, usually at 50 times per second or 50 hertz. This alternating flow is ideal for power distribution over long distances and is commonly used in homes and businesses. On the other hand, DC flows in only one direction, making it suitable for devices that rely on batteries or solar panels. While most of the devices in our homes, TVs, computers, phone chargers, convert AC back to DC for their internal operation, AC's advantages for power transmission over long distances with its ability to be stepped up and down in voltage make it the preferred choice for our electric grid. By increasing the voltage, it means for the same power, we can have less current and therefore less heat. Ever wondered how electricity is generated and transmitted to our homes? Well, let's shed some light on that subject. Much of our electricity is generated in power stations by turning water into steam and then using that steam to turn an alternator. By controlling the alternator's rotational speed, we can control the frequency of the electric supply. It's crucial for all power generation sources to work at the same frequency for the electrical grid to function properly. The generated electricity initially has high voltage levels, typically around 25,000 volts or 25 kilovolts. For long distance transmission, this voltage is boosted to around 400 kilovolts. This allows efficient power transfer. As the electricity approaches substations, the voltage is reduced to 132 kilovolts, then further step down to 33 kilovolts and 11 kilovolts before finally reaching residential areas 
at 400 volts for three phase and 230 volts for single phase power. Once the electricity reaches our property, the cabling, meter and service fuse belong to the supply authority, while everything after the meter belongs to the consumer. This separation point ensures that the responsibility for maintaining and managing electrical installations is clear. Let's shed some light on lighting circuits. Lighting circuits are often wired in a radial configuration where each overhead light is supplied individually. On the other hand, ring final circuits are a bit different. The cable starts and finishes at the consumer unit and each socket is connected into a loop. A spur is a single or double socket taken off the ring circuit identifiable by a single cable connecting it. For safety, a socket with three wires per connection typically indicates that a spur has been taken off it. The cabling for the spur should be at the same size as the ring, and if the spur is fused, slightly different rules apply. In a fused spur, all appliances should be protected by the fuse. Bonding plays a crucial role in ensuring electrical safety by connecting metal water pipes, gas meters and other extraneous conductive parts to the main earthing bar. These connections must be marked with safety electrical connection label to ensure that there's no potential difference between these conductive parts in the event of a fault. The primary purpose of bonding is to prevent any dangerous potential between conductive parts in the case of an electrical fault. By providing a low resistance path to earth, bonding helps facilitate the safe dissipation of fault currents, protecting both people and equipment from harm. Next, we delved into circuit protection and the crucial role of residual current devices RCDs. RCDs are specialized devices designed to protect against electrical shock and prevent potential accidents caused by current leakage to earth. An RCD constantly monitors the flow of current between the line and the neutral conductors. If there is an imbalance in the currents, which can occur if there's a fault and current is leaking to earth, the RCD quickly detects this and automatically trips, disconnecting the faulty circuit from the power supply. This feature is incredibly valuable for personal safety, especially in situations where someone might inadvertently touch a faulty appliance that's leaking current. The RCD acts swiftly to cut off the power, preventing any harm to the individual. It's worth noting that RCDs are available in different sensitivity levels, typically measured in milliamps. The most common value is 30 milliamps, which provides excellent protection against electrical shocks. Higher sensitivity RCDs offer even more protection, but there's always a balance to strike between safety and practicality. As budding electricians, one of the essential skills we must master is circuit isolation. Before conducting any electrical work, it's vital to ensure that the circuit is safely isolated to avoid potential accidents and injuries. The process involves several steps. First, we identify the source of the electrical supply to the circuit we're working on. Then we proceed to isolate the supply, making sure that it can't be accidentally turned on while we're working on it. To secure the isolation, we use locks and signage, providing clear visual cues to others that the circuit is off limits. Testing the isolation is crucial to verify what we believe to be isolated is indeed dead. This is where a testing device comes into play. We use tools like voltage testers to confirm that no voltage is present in the circuit we're about to work on. The final step is to use a known live power source on the testing device to ensure it's working correctly. This is a foolproof way to ensure that we've isolated the circuit effectively and that it's safe to proceed with our work. 
Moving on to the practical aspects of electrical installations, I explored different types of cables and terminations used in wiring. For instance, single core PVC insulated cables and sheath cables are commonly employed in electrical installations. Sheathed cables like meter tails are particularly useful for connecting electrical meters to consumer units. PVC twin and earth cables are another common sight in households featuring two core colours, brown and blue, with an additional copper CPC cable for earth, which is not insulated. I also learned about the importance of heat resistant PVC cables, which are designed to withstand higher temperatures, ensuring safety even in demanding conditions. When it comes to installation, properly securing the cables with clips and maintaining the correct spacing is crucial. Following the guidelines provided in the IET on-site guide ensures that the cables are installed safely and efficiently. Terminating cables and flexible cords are also require special attention. Ensuring that the conductor fills as much of the terminal as possible helps maintain solid connections preventing loose or weak joints that could lead to issues in the future. We rounded up by looking at the process of installing a few spur outlet, which can be useful in providing power to a appliance that requires its own dedicated circuit. When installing a fuse spur, it's essential to use the correct size of fuse, matching it to the load requirements of the appliance. This ensures that the circuit is adequately protected and that the fuse will blow in the event of an overcurrent situation. The installation process requires attention to detail, such as using grommets when using a metal back box to prevent damage to the cables and ensuring safe connections. For example, an immersion heater requires its own individual circuit from the consumer unit with a 20 amp double pole switch and appropriate fusing. The cable between the immersion heater and the switch can be surface mounted or flush fitted depending on the desired aesthetics and practicality. Flush fitting involves chasing out the wall to accommodate the back box and fuse spur outlet, which allows for a neat and professional installation. When running cables through joists, it's essential to drill in the centre of the joist and prevent weakening. Another handy feature of this is that when joists are screwed into, say to put floorboards or plasterboards in, they usually are screwed from either side, top or bottom. So, by having it in the centre, it means that the wire can't be screwed into. Well, let's face it, there's always a way, but it reduces the chances of this happening. In conclusion, this week one has been a journey filled with fascinating discoveries. From the captivating world of power loss and overheating to the significance of proper cable sizing and securing connections, We've taken the first steps in understanding the fundamentals of electrical installations. Next week, we'll be looking at some of the electrical tests an electrician would carry out. Thanks for joining me in this electrifying adventure into the world of electricity. Remember, knowledge is power, and the more we learn together, the brighter our future as electricians will be. So let's keep exploring, keep learning, and before you know it, you'll be mastering the art of electrical circuits and installations with ease. Stay curious and keep that spark for knowledge alive, and together, we'll illuminate the way in becoming a skilled electrician. You know, you don't have to be an aspiring electrician to learn some of this. So, if this is interesting or useful, then like and subscribe. Oh. And one final thing, this video is sponsored by, <laughs> I'm only joking.